the subject that <clears throat> we have assigned for this particular time is problem people and people with problems. And in the little time that we have, I'd like to suggest that you consider these three aspects. <clears throat> First, I'd like to have us take a little time just to refresh our minds as to some of the problem people or people with problems that we read about in the pastoral epistles. First, in 2 Timothy and Titus. I personally believe that the Holy Spirit has had this recorded and kept and preserved for us that we might be reminded of certain problem people and people with problems so as to think not only of the folks on the island of Crete or of the people in Ephesus as something peculiar but back of that particular detail or back of that particular item there was a problem that we might meet then secondly I'd like to have us consider or at least have our attention drawn to theological concepts or a theological philosophy uh, that exists that prevents problems or deters problems or corrects problems or in the absence of which problems will not be prevented that could be others will not be deterred or slowed down though they could be and others will not be corrected though they could be so the first we're going to look at a few problem situations on the island of Crete and in the city of Ephesus and then we want to consider the what I consider the major cause why problems are not dealt with more successfully and then thirdly obviously uh, what we are to do who stand in the place of ministry problem people and people with problems may I quickly then draw your attention to a few of them as we have them in 1st Timothy then we'll go to 2nd Timothy and so on <clears throat> in 1st Timothy in those verses 4 through 7 you have fables genealogies things that people get wrapped up in and these fables I think could uh, stretch all the way from the sophisticated concept or the theory of evolution uh, to the way out Gnostic theories of those days we do not know just what they were particularly but we are reminded that it can go on even now and then notice in, the, in we're still in the first chapter of first Timothy in, in uh, chapter in verse 20 you have Hymenaeus and uh, Alexander uh, thus reminding us of a different situation that is where uh, there is a, a consciousness of sin a consciousness of sin but where it is not dealt with <clears throat> it can destroy faith and lead to to shipwreck and that was the part that he's emphasizing uh, here in the second chapter let's move along in, in first Timothy uh, verses 12 verse 12 I suffer not a woman to uh, <laughs> teach and the fellows who have not obeyed the last five words will have to obey the first two the seven words are I suffer not a woman to teach and if he doesn't obey the last five he will have to obey the first two I suffer <laughs> then in chapter 3 in verse 4 for example 
uh, talk about a problem. He that ruleth well his own house. Uh, isn't that a problem that is not just ancient? may be difficult to find an elder, find a man uh, that really meets the basic qualifications. But isn't there also another problem? And that is how to unload someone uh, that no longer qualifies. These are things that we can well consider. In the fourth chapter, of course, the apostle is giving a prophetic word. Uh, a prophetic word. The time will come when they will depart from the faith. Well, we understand that here is prophecy. We find ourselves in a particular period just like that. But certainly, Timothy was, ex was to expect seeing some of this in his time. And we are not to be surprised if we find a departure from the faith. Uh, it's, it's hard to believe. It's hard to believe that anybody has sense enough to come in out of the rain would depart from the faith. But they, they will. And also while we're in, in, in uh, ver uh, chapter 4, 1 Timothy 7, uh, I think of uh, old wives' fables and isle tales that could even endanger health, by the way, some of the remedies. <laughs> I don't know what they will all have been. And then in chapter 5, he has spends a lot of time concerning women and widows and the younger women who have or create problems. Even casting off their first, first faith. Chapter 6, uh, first verses have to do with servants to respect their masters and not to despise believing masters. Isn't there a principle here that ought to be considered? Have you come across this? Where because my boss is not a Christian, I don't have to do as good a job as if he were. Or because my boss is a Christian, the rascal ought to pay me more than he does. And because he doesn't, I don't have to work as hard or whatever. You see, there's something in here. Uh, all of these, I think, will fit into the general theme of today's subject. Problem people and people with problems as they affect the local assembly. Uh, then in the latter part of chapter 6, you have uh, to speak, in verse 17, to speak to them who are materially rich, that they uh, trust not in in themselves not to trust in riches but to trust in the living God and and to do good probably not too many of us have uh, very wealthy people in our congregation but most of us are likely to have a few who have a little bit more than the other fellow does and is it possible that he might be proud is it possible that that fellow might feel that we can't get along without him well, that's something we can look at a little bit later. In 2 Timothy, in the second chapter, you have Hymenaeus mentioned again in verse 18 and uh, Philetus. Notice saying that the resurrection is past already. Uh, wouldn't this have something to do with dispensational ignorance? I would think so. And uh, certainly it has to do with failure to, in our day, it would have failure to recognize literal interpretation. I think of the amillennial teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, where uh, they, they teach that when, if you're a Christian, well, there is no, then, then you have this new, new life, there is, is a resurrection and so on, so many different theories, you're familiar with that. Uh, these are problems. You move on into chapter 2. Verse 23, foolish, unlearned questions. And then, of course, you have in fourth chapter the reminder of things to come that we heard Brother Probasco mentioned again this morning. Chapter 4, verse 3 of Second Timothy, they will not endure sound doctrine. Here a problem no question about it. Problems in the local assembly. 
And Timothy was to expect to ex uh, find this and ex feel it and sense it. And it's not just a, a prophecy for the end time. And we certainly know where we're living in today. And, and uh, I guess we have all encountered that, haven't we? So we mentioned some of these things. We, we say, why, I, I, I've met these people. I've already met these people, haven't you? Well, I think most of us have. And then in uh, chapter 4, verse 10, Demoth has forsaken me. The quitter. The quitter. Not because of doctrine, but just because he was a quitter. We've all had that. I have. People that you thought were could, you could rely on and depend on, and they, they didn't disagree with you on doctrine or anything. They just were quitters. Demon, Demas hath forsaken me. Titus brings up another aspect. Fables are mentioned so often. In the first chapter of Titus, verse 14, he speaks of Jewish fables. Well, evidently there were different kinds. And in chapter 2, verse 3, he speaks of the aged women as false accusers and warning them against being given to much wine. Now, I've met these people too. Uh, not only false accusers that we we had our brother Probasco remind us of, even I was thinking of that when he was speaking of of, uh, of Miriam, but uh, women who are given to much wine. They get to a certain stage in life, a certain age, and they begin to feel that life has passed them by. They become sorry for themselves. And uh, if it isn't, wine that they're given to uh, or taking uh, they begin to take uh, pills of one kind or another to try to get over try to forget uh, try to get away from, escape from what they feel is a realism that they that they cannot face these are are problems and as our subject is problem people and people with problems we should uh, uh, face these things Paul was quite disturbed by the fickleness of women, easily led, unstable, and unduly critical. And Paul seems to repeat and emphasize the, the sins of the unruly tongue and how easily women can be led away by the uh, rascals that he, he speaks of as creeping into homes and, and, and so forth. And uh, also in, in, in uh, isn't it in, in Titus chapter 3, verse 6, it talks about creeping into homes. Silly women paying attention. They get in by radio. They get in by television. Isn't that something? I suppose it's never happened in your church or in your parish. Now, I may be wrong, but I believe that the Holy Spirit has had this recorded for us so that we we would expect to see this you know you can just think of your think of a modern timothy or a modern titus saying well lord if that's the way it's going to be send somebody else who wants this and i think here are some truths that and realities that we ought to face and realize that they exist and it's the flesh it's the old nature. Okay, we've looked at a few sample problems. They cover just about everything, don't they? I haven't mentioned them all. You've read them many, many times. Real people with real problems or causing real problems. Either because they don't know how to handle themselves or they want to control the church and so forth and so on. I wonder if you'd be willing to take a little time with me and just to consider very seriously, but not critically, or at least not critical of anybody else but ourselves, consider what is the major contributing cause that encourages the flesh, gives it such uh, leeway, Now, I personally believe 
that the major contributing cause for problems arising and for failure to handle them properly is the careless or ignorant interpretation of Scripture on the part of the pastor or the people. I, I may be wrong. I'm not an authority. But I'm con convinced, and if I'm wrong, I want you to show me that one of the major, if not the major, cause contributing to the flesh, getting away with it, is due to ignorance or careless interpretation of dispensational truth. Because the people do not know. I'm glad somebody said amen here, so uh, maybe you'd come up here and sit with me because pretty, <laughs> pretty soon I'd just like to be encouraged, uh, really. You know, it's easy to subscribe to literal interpretation. But have we thought it through? What are we saying? I've been invited to speak at the next regional. And if you think of it, and, and I'm sure you'll think of it when you get the notice in, uh, in August that there's going to be another regional, I'd appreciate your praying for, for me. Because I'm going to, by invitation, I'm going to include some of my testimony of how the Lord dealt in my life and the influence that an ism had upon my soul and upon my mind and upon my heart and explain also why I hate the ism because I know the power it can have and back of it is the failure to know how to understand scripture literally now literally and it's dangerous to get away from it. And if we have literal interpretation, what's the next step? It has to be dispensational. Amen. This is the logical step that I have to take in my own life. And if it is now dispensational, that means that I'm living in a time and I am part of a unit that never was before this time. That God created a new thing that did not exist prior to Acts 2. Except in the mind of God. And that God created What's that word? Created a new race in the new Adam. The last Adam. The second Adam. I believe that we have not spent enough time thinking through what this means. The supernatural aspect of it. You see, if a guy has problems or he causes problems in the church. If the church doesn't know, and he doesn't know, and especially if the pastor doesn't know who he's dealing with, how is anything good going to come out of it? Are we dealing with him in his problems on the basis of the fact that he's a descendant of the first Adam? Or are we dealing with him on the basis of his profession that he's a descendant of the second Adam? It makes all the difference in the world. And because we try to deal with him in the old Adam, which can't be converted anyway, we're licked before we begin. And we can begin to lose out ourselves spiritually. There are other factors too. You and I know this. 
But our, do our people know it? You and I subscribe to the new creation created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Created. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, but in Christ Jesus, what avails? Nothing availeth but a new creation. And if any man be in Christ, he is somewhat improved. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. And some of the past is gone. Huh? Okay. Now, have we thought it through? Have we thought it through? See? And have we helped our people to see it? Now, this new creation is peculiar. Something God never did before. And that was to move in to live in the human being. This is the genius of apostolic Christianity. And any other Christianity is spurious. But it is a truth that has been forgotten and neglected. And though it has been subscribed to by Bible college graduates and, and, uh, and ordination councils, it has not really been practiced because it hasn't been even thought through. A little bit of help in this. Let's keep going now. Now, every one of these people in that local church, local assembly, has a bit of the supernatural in him. Isn't that what it means to be born again? Isn't he a member of God's family? Doesn't he have God's nature? Doesn't he have God's life? We were singing that yesterday. Did you know it? In several of the songs. I have God's life. I have God's life. Now on what basis are we dealing with the problem people? Of the old Adam? Or the new Adam? I'm just putting it out. We, we couldn't possibly explore every aspect of it now. But I say we're creating a climate in which the flesh can run rampant if the pastor himself isn't clear on dispensational truth. And he's not going to be even generally supported if his people have never heard of it. And the individual who might be helped is not going to be treated where his sickness is in its greatest need. And we're going to be very reluctant to throw anybody out who ought to be thrown out because we don't know what's involved. Maybe in our next regional we'll be able to go into some of these things. Why not make a note of it? Things that you think we ought to be considering. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, behold, look, he says, observe. You can see it for yourself. All things are become new. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Know ye not your own selves? How that Christ be in you, except you're a phony? Well, now that means that there is the Holy Spirit in the individual. That means that we have two natures. How many psychiatrists do you suppose understand this when people have problems that they've got two natures when they're dealing with a Christian? You and I know it. But have we thought it through and have we come to the place where we're able to deal with people on that basis, including ourselves? We have two natures, do we not? For the evil that I would not, that I do. I find then that the flesh rust lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these two are contrary the one to the other. 
how many believers understand this? And if they're not believers, why are they in our church to start with? You see? Hey, people who spend an awful lot of money to go to a psychiatrist. I don't think you can do it for less than 35 bucks. But he can come and talk to you, my pastor friend, who won't cost him a thing, except a little trouble. And if you know how to deal with him, not on the basis of the old nature, but on the basis of the new nature, if he's got one, you're going to help him. And if he isn't born again, it ought to be brought to the surface, then you've got a salvation message to give him. You see how important it is? We can talk about problems and problem people and all of this, but I think to start with, we've got to know what we are. A new humanity, just as distinct as when God created the first one. And the first one is fallen, and it cannot be converted. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And a lot of our fundamental teaching is designed to improve the old Adam so that he looks a little bit more like a Christian. And, and that's the wrong approach. God's all done with that old, old one. You cannot teach his... Sir, his sir, uh, I was going to say social security. <laughs> it, eternal security. <laughs> See, the old Adam gets nervous. <laughs> but we cannot teach eternal security. Really or believer's baptism by immersion or a number of other things without clearly understanding that we are a new creation a new humanity God created one new man and the exhortation to the believers is to put off the old man the old man put on the new man what does that mean have we thought it through Possibly not. I think it's so easy to accept these statements without thinking them through. And then when it comes down to the crisis time, we don't quite have what it takes. All things are passed away. If we are a new creation then we should look into the word of God for what he has provided for this new creation. We are not called primarily to copy the earthly life of Jesus as exemplary as that was. But we are called to radiate out the heavenly life of the Lord Jesus. We have it in our song. Moment by moment, I'm kept in his love. Moment by moment, I've life from above. Is that human life? Or is it divine life? Is it perishing life? Or is it resurrection life? Is it God's life? We live by faith. I, I don't feel very godly. Even saintly. It isn't my feeling, but God says it. And it's on that basis that God demands of me a conduct that he expects me to provide and to fulfill because he lives in me to fulfill it. We have something that Moses never had, as Brother Probasco reminded us. Do we not? We have a 24-hour-a-day indwelling Almighty. How we need to learn this so that we develop according to his law of life and growth. Now, the Roman Catholic Church ignored completely 
what Dr. Ironside said very clearly was a part of the mystery of iniquity. And that was to create a Christianity out of the Jewish religion and the synoptics. And this is what the Roman Catholic Church did, including borrowing liberally from the paganism, paganism and the philosophy of the world. And then going back into the Old Testament in order to get an altar and a priesthood, etc., etc. And then going into, into the uh, uh, synoptics in order to emphasize humility, following Jesus, uh, punishing yourself or whatever they wanted to teach. No, that's not where we begin. I remember it's happened to me uh, in, uh, in teaching the, the fact that the local church consists of uh, living cells that have the life of God and where, where, where his body his body in the local community and so forth and the people have said well this has happened to me well you, you don't love the Old Testament you don't you don't appreciate the Old Testament <laughs> well how are you going to answer people like that it's been my major and and I'm teaching it in the Bible Institute now, and, and so what, how, how are you going to explain that to people? Who do not understand that the old is gone, the new is here, and it's supernatural, and God has given us all the instruction we need how to function that way. Talk about strivings about the law. We have had, and you may have had, arguments, bitter and, and powerful and, and hurtful concerning divorce and remarriage and a lot of other things because they went back into the law and they didn't get into this dispensation. And so, like Roman, we have the unpardonable sin, don't we? Even in the IFCA, we've got a lot to learn in kindness and courtesy and thoughtfulness with respect to the feelings and the foibles and the weaknesses of human nature. Problem people and people with problems, well, you can't avoid them. But having said this, how important it is to know dispensational truth and don't be afraid of it. I, I, I know you know this, but from time to time, dispensational truth has surfaced in Christian history. Somebody got hold of the Bible, and somebody found out something, and they would only go so far, and they began to look ahead and see what would happen if we followed through. And it was too costly, and they backed off. Very few stuck with it. Very few. In the times of the Reformation, well, we go even beyond that, go to the fourth century, the Montanus and others, they began to see a new dispensation. The Holy Spirit indwelling people they could only go so far then they got scared and they pulled back and who took over the extremists took over we've had it repeated again and again in our day and I say in more recent times you have people like the Plymouth Brethren that began to emphasize dispensational truth well balanced and so forth they get just so far and I'm talking not just about the Plymouth Brethren but the rest of us who've been benefited greatly by that and things that used to come out of Dallas Seminary years ago and so forth 
and you begin to find where it's going to go, and you say, oh, 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 oh. I, I hate to let go of the old Adam. I, I don't like to think of the local church as an organism. I want to think of it as an organization. And an awful lot of our troubles due to the fact that we're thinking of the local church as an organization. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know that, but. But look, before we put that B-U-T in there, why not take a little time and really examine what is meant by an organism, a living entity? Then when we get around to the matter of organization, I think we'll be better prepared to make the right decisions. But the thing I want to warn you of is that whenever a truth has been surfaced, like the second coming of Christ, the rapture, something like that. Unless people hold it in its proper place and really follow through with it now, which in the case of the rapture would be how we live and how we act and the brevity of time and the importance of reaching the lost, etc. Unless we do that, the radicals will take over. And radicals have taken over dispensational truth. One of the things I hate is ultra-dispensationalism. Maybe you've never had any contact with it. I have. They were in my church. And oh, sure, they subscribe to everything. And when they find that you're talking about one new man so making peace and all of that, oh boy, is this lovely. But they're just waiting for the time to get themselves more better acquainted with folks and then begin to feed them with their damnable ultra-dispensationalism. The Lord's Supper is not for this age. Didn't you know that? Have you heard it? Well, I had them in my church. Baptism is not for this age. They started in probably when way back like the old what they O'Hare is that one of them and some of them and Stams and others started out in a certain sense well enough recognizing that there was a different time today that God is doing a new thing today and it is to glorify himself by living in people this is God's program today uh, don't you see then what effect that would have on our deportment in the church? And that it's God's purpose not that to win as many thousands as you can in your community, but that the believers in your assembly so function together as a living body that the world becomes conscious of the head. If I could crouch down behind this thing and just wave my hand, you would be convinced that though you only saw the hand, you would be convinced there was a head connected to it. And if the, and, and if the local believers will, can be taught to understand, we have to forgive one another. We have to put up with one another. Because the world is not going to see a functioning body administered by the head if we're going to be fragmented. I mean, that's not saying it all, but it just some of these things that are peculiar to this dispensation. It's not just a matter of once it was Israel, now it's the church. There is more involved than that. We have things now that Israel, that Israel never had. And we're not living according to our potential. I'm sure of it. But oh, these ultra dispensationalists and you know they have their effect on their on your people so that even after they've moved out because it got too warm for them they move out you still have people in your church who are not really sold on baptism they go along with it to please Pastor Helgerson and they can't find enough in the scripture to be against it Okay? They still go along with the Lord's Supper because they figure that that's kind of 
slows people down and you know makes them more serious but they're not too happy about it we could get along without it where did they get it from they got it from people that are no longer in our church but the seeds are there see this new dispensation also means that there's makes a difference in praying now, I believe in being simple and childlike in our praying. But you know, in being in Christ this way, we have a different position and a different purpose and a different pro priority in prayer. And as a result, we have so many Christians in our churches, they don't know how to pray. They are almost glad if you fall down and break your leg because now there's something specific that they can pray about. That God will give you a, 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 a heal your leg fast. You see? They understand that. But how many of us spend time in the prayers that the Apostle Paul has given out of his own heart, out of his own experience, inspired by the Holy Spirit? Instead, you find so much in Christianity praying, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name and very few praying to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because they do not know our position I'm not talking about phraseology the more simple the prayer the warmer I feel toward the guy that's praying <laughs> but how about our position and what is God's priority what is God seeking to do today with four billion people on the face of the earth is it, is it to rescue three and a half billion? Or is it to manifest himself in those whom he has chosen? There is a priority, beloved. And if we know dispensational truth, it'll help us tremendously to understand what our purpose is. And we won't feel so defeated when the other guy has umpteen buses. And I don't have any. But we can't develop it all today. Let's spend real time on this and be willing to learn and be willing to be corrected. Our people don't know how to pray. And you know, they don't even know how to worship. Now a church like this has some good song books many of you have I don't feel that we have the best songbook but you know the average Christian does not know how to worship has no idea of worship because he's all geared to the idea of me and my and how I feel and so most of the songs that are written have to do with me and my and how I feel but so little directed toward thou art wonderful. Thou art great, O Lord. And greatly to be praised. And, and so forth. See, we have a different concept of worship. In spirit and in truth. In this new dispensation. Then there is a unique and dispensational work of God in, in the believer. God's trying to make you and me a little more like Jesus. And sometimes, as our speaker has already reminded us, we may have to get hurt. We may have to learn the hard way. We may have to get banged and insulted and disappointed in order that we might be more like him. I think we need to re-emphasize in the whole context of this that there may be problems of all kinds in the church but we have, we're not going to get anywhere trying to deal with them at all unless we know where we are dispensationally. Now that leads to the third point and then we can go and eat. And that has to do with what is the cure, what is to prevent, what is to deter, what is to correct. Well, let's mention a few things to each other. 
does not the apostle write to Timothy that there's something he should avoid am I right avoid okay that's one thing so we need to learn what to avoid I, I think it's a mistake if a pastor feels that every time there's something develops that he sees as bad that he should make a beeline for it to go into a collision course I'm not sure that that's the way to act every every time maybe the Lord needs to get to that guy before you do Okay, avoid. What's another one? What's a word that Paul uses a lot? I charge, I charge them. I charge them. And uh, preach the word. I, I'm not a betting man, but I think that a lot of our brethren in the South have no idea what the word preach means. They think it means to prepare an oration and wang away at it. Well, what does it mean? It means to announce, to make known, to declare. And because they think of it only in terms of preaching and bombastic and, and uh, all of that sort of thing, they've missed so much of the meaning of Scripture announce the word but also what's another one he uses teach teach admonish beware pardon I didn't hear that one flee why that wouldn't be a cowardly thing to do wouldn't it no but it wasn't a cowardly thing for Joseph to run away when Potty Four's wife was making passes at her. <laughs> All of this is in here. And it's to the pastoral epistles that we ought to learn to avoid, to flee, <laughs> to teach, and then all of this, but to see it in the, in the context of the new creation. We can't make Jews out of these people, and we can't reform the old Adam. He needs to be buried. And we need to learn how to deal with the new nature. Think of how many of us have inner conflicts. But we don't go to get on that couch and have a guy listen to us and, then, and, and have him try to find out if we hated our mother. <laughs> no. But we have these two natures. And this has come about because of God's marvelous plan to do a new thing on the face of the earth. Let's not be afraid to apply the scripture, but to apply it in the context. It's the only safe way of interpretation. And it, uh, I mentioned a moment ago that we can't really teach eternal security or believer's baptism by immersion and so on without a recognition a full recognition of dispensational uh, a, a truth. But isn't it also true that we cannot get people to understand this new life in Christ without this teaching? So, where have I been guilty? I have been guilty of not repeating it often enough. I think the first, I know, the first generation Christians knew more of what it means to be a Christian than many Christians today because they didn't have umpteen brands to choose from. There was one and that was that you have new life in God. The others, they're, they are alienated from the life of God, aren't they? You know, it's something like this. And you'll find that the epistles simply cannot be understood by your people without the knowledge of the new creation and the new humanity and, and the new race and apply, applying doctrine. I think 
that we like instant things, instant coffee, instant tea, instant soup, instant holiness. Uh, there must be some quick way. And yet, there, I don't think there is. The word doctrine occurs 17 times in First and Second Timothy and Titus. Doctrine. Sound doctrine. Give them doctrine. Yeah, but they don't like it. They, they got, they've got itching ears. Give them sound doctrine. And we have a tendency to give them the gospel. Well, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but they will endure the gospel, especially if you reduce it to the point where it's just that God loves you <laughs> and that Christ died for you and, and, and everybody's welcome. If you can reduce it to that, they, they'll endure it. But get into doctrine, how to live, how to behave. Give none offense, neither to the Jew, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the, to the assembly of God. How many of our people even think that their conduct should be uh, considered in that basis? How does this reflect upon the local assembly? Does it create an issue the way I dress? Or does it make for peace and harmony? All of these things are related. So I feel that while we've looked at some problems, and secondly, I believe that a true understanding of our dispensational position is the best climate for preventing or deterring or correcting that the admonition from Paul himself to give the word of God is the solution. Thank you very much.